All right, guys, we're wrapping up our Gilded Age uh, PowerPoint lecture from the other day. Uh, one of the last things we talked about was Ulysses S. Grant and the uh, scandals that kind of plagued his presidency. One was the whiskey ring affair, and the other was the credit mobilier scandal regarding the railroad. So it is, again, the era of good stealings. Uh, another sort of uh, negative thing that happens during this time period uh, is because of Rutherford B. Hayes. Remember, if you remember correctly, Rutherford B. Hayes is the one who ends Reconstruction, and they have this horrible compromise of 1877, where you have three states, uh, Louisiana, Florida, and there was another one, um, where the election is so close that they, the Republicans think there's too much you know, uh, intimidation going on in the South uh, to African Americans, and Democrats are saying, no, you just don't want to lose the election. And so they come up with this compromise. If Rutherford B. Hayes uh, can be elected, then he promises to remove all federal troops from the South. And that's where we get the compromise of 1877. The other state, obviously, was South Carolina. It's on the board. It's on the screen right here. Um, so he defeats uh, Samuel Tilden, a Democrat. And so we have this compromise of 1877. Okay, They would recognize Hayes as president. And of course, I just told you Hayes is going to remove the troops and this is going to end Reconstruction. This is also going to cause a lot of problems for African-Americans where they were able to vote with little restrictions at all uh, because federal troops were providing protection here. Now they're going to have lots of uh, barriers to voting. And so nothing's going to change in the South really until like the 1950s and 60s. <clears throat> Pretty sad. Um, Hayes is also going to provide the people who supported his reelection as part of the compromise with uh, jobs in his administration, working for the Transcontinental Railroad and federal uh, other federal positions. This is again because of the patronage and spoil system. Okay, so Rutherford B. Hayes, also known as Rutherford Fraud B. Hayes or his fraudulence, Rutherford Fraud B. Hayes, <laughs> He does become president following the Compromise of 1877, uh, and this bears on our conversation about uh, unions and strikes. Uh, Rutherford B. Hayes sort of uh, sets the bar uh, and sets the precedence for, for how the U.S. government is going to deal with strikes. We need the railroad. Uh, are, is the government going to support workers who are demanding a, a better wage and better working conditions? Or is the government going to support the big businessmen? And Rutherford B. Hayes uh, sort of sets the precedent, and he says, well, well there's this great railroad strike. Uh, we need the railroad, so I'm going to send in troops to break up the strike. And so we have mul multiple strikes after this that sort of follow the same idea of supporting big business over the worker. And it's not until the anthracite coal strike with my boy, Teddy Roosevelt, where he actually sides with the workers. So uh, it's going to be a long road for uh, for African-Americans because of Hayes, and it's going to be a long road for workers because of uh, for rather fraud B. Hayes. Okay? So this signals the end of Reconstruction. The Supreme Court undermines Reconstruction uh, because of cases like Plessy versus Ferguson. Uh, the civil rights cases of 1883, South Carolina said that the 14th Amendment only protected against government violation of civil rights and that people were free to discriminate however they wanted to. Uh, this is going to be reinforced by Plessy versus Ferguson, which is going to establish things like segregation and Jim Crow laws in the South. Uh, the Civil Rights uh, Act of 1883 overturns the Civil Rights Act of 1875 that gave African Americans uh, freedoms and, and protected them when they went to vote and participate in government. So we're going to see uh, all those, you know, primarily black legislatures, legislatures in the South that were uh, somewhat corrupt, but were actually uh, allowing African Americans to participate in government, they're going to go away because of the civil rights cases of 1883. And again, this is going to lead to uh, things like Jim Crow laws, uh, segregation, uh, all because of the Plessy versus Ferguson case. Plessy uh, was a man in Louisiana actually. And he thought that he could ride in the white person section on a train. And he thought he was protected under the 14th Amendment, giving equal protection under the law. And the Supreme Court shot that down and says uh, the Supreme Court didn't mean for it to provide all equal account, all, all accommodations should be equal. They had to be separate, but equal. And so th that's the precedent set by Plessy versus Ferguson. And as we know from hindsight, uh, the accommodations for African-Americans were separate but they were not equal, okay? And so during this time as well, at the turn of the century, you're gonna see thousands of African-Americans being lynched for breaking these Jim Crow laws. And that's gonna to lead to uh, reforms later, especially through a woman named Ida B. Wells.
Okay. This is a, a picture from the Caddo Courthouse uh, in 1898, where African Americans uh, turned out in droves to uh, exercise their right to vote. Uh, a lot of this is going to change with the Im implementation of Jim Crow laws. Okay. So we have this idea of the New South. It's promoting the South should rebuild, industrialize, develop their economy. Uh, but as we know, after, during Reconstruction, even after Reconstruction for a long time, sharecropping, tenant farming, they continue to dominate the region. And so they're, they're really just slavery part two. Uh, you're not property if you're an African-American sharecropper, but you're, you're stuck in this cycle of working for someone else and never achieving your own freedom uh, with regard to uh, economic freedom, that is. Okay. So life for African-Americans in post-Reconstruction South continued to be filled with lots of challenges. Uh, the inability to vote and change thing is probably one of the worst. Okay. And so what we get because of Jim Crow laws, because they're not allowed to freely vote, is states start erecting things like literacy tests. You have to prove you can read. And these tests are rigged. There's no way you can pass them. Uh, poll taxes, you have to pay to vote, which is very unfair. Uh, now it's unconstitutional, but it, it wasn't at the time. And then something like a grandfather clause, and these are really weird because in order for you to vote, your grandfather had to have voted in like the last election when he could vote. They're really kind of convoluted laws. Uh, but what they're all meant to do is prevent African Americans from voting. And what also it does, and a lot of people don't understand this, also prevents a lot of poor whites from voting. So it's not just towards uh, African Americans, it is primarily for African Americans, but it does affect poor whites as well. And so the white Democrats are called the redeemers. These are the ones that want to bring things back to the way they were uh, in the South. Uh, and they're going to reassume power. And then we're going to get the, the influx of uh, KKK membership. And we're going to have just discrimination rampant in the South until about, you know, well, really until about the 1980s. Okay. But uh, we're going to talk about the modern civil rights movement later on. Okay. So James Garfield, a Republican, uh, he's assassinated, and it's important to know why. Uh, James Garfield was one of the few people who stood up and said, I'm not going to subscribe to the idea of patronage, the spoil system. I'm not going to give someone a job in my administration just because they helped me get, helped me get elected. And so a man named Charles J. Gateau, uh, disappointed, did not get the office he wanted. Uh, he did help get Garfield elected, and Garfield said, no, I'm sorry, I'm not going to give you the job. And so uh, he basically went out and uh, decided to shoot Garfield and kill him. And so the result of this, you know, because we see that patronage obviously has its flaws, not only the fact that we're not hiring the right people for the right jobs, is we're going to see sort of reforms in the area of civil service. We're going to have something called the Pendleton Act, which is going to require you to take a test uh, to get certain government jobs. You know, a, a chief uh, chief of police is one. We had that issue in Shreveport, uh, a, I don't know, a month ago or so. Uh, so this is going to be a big deal. And we're going to start finally start getting people who are qualified to do the jobs, not just friends and supporters of uh, political candidates. Okay. Uh, and of course, I just told you about the Pendleton Act. This is going to cause the Civil Service Commission to be formed. This is going to cause civil service reform. And this is all going to be done uh, because of, of Vice President Chester A. Arthur, who will take over after Garfield. Grover Cleveland, a Democrat, he's not the prettiest man. Uh, he's going to support laissez-faire policies, no government interference in business. However, he is going to sign the Interstate Commerce Act into law. And what's important about that is Farmers are struggling on the Great Plains uh, for lots of reasons. Uh, mechanization uh, equipment is causing them to, to borrow a lot of money to pay for this new, new equipment. Uh, farm prices are low because of overproduction. And the only way to ship products is through a monopoly called the railroad. And so farmers are going to fight to battle the railroads and battle the banks in something called the populist movement. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But this is like the first step in getting them some reforms is that, you know, finally, uh, the states are going to have the right to regulate commerce and set sort of maximum sh uh, railroad shipping rates. And that's a big deal for farmers who are struggling on the Great Plains. Okay. Benjamin Harrison, uh, he's another Republican who waves the, the bloody shirt. He wins the election in 1888. He won the popular, uh, he did not win the popular vote. He won the Electoral College. Grover Cleveland won the popular vote. Uh, he was for keeping the tariff high. Again, this is a typical Republican uh, precedent set. Let's keep tariffs high. Let's protect domestic products. Uh, he's going to spend the entire treasury surplus and he's going to pass one of the largest tariffs in history up until Harvard, Herbert Hoover in the 20s. Um, 
he passes something called the McKinley tariff. And what was going on at the time is farmers are struggling. I told you about that. Someone else who was struggling was miners in the West. And miners were struggling because they're mining out all this, this silver in places like Nevada. We talked about the Comstock load. And there is a, there's a surplus of silver. And so, of course, you know, law, supply and demand, if there's a surplus of something, uh, the value goes down, the price goes down. And so we have farmers on one hand who want more money to be loaned to them from banks so they can buy equipment. Uh, and they have miners who want prices to go up for silver. So what's the solution for these two uh, groups? The solution is let's start a, a silver standard, which means we're going to base paper money off of silver and gold. Later, it becomes known as bimetallism. And so farmers, um, they, they actually want to cause inflation so they can raise prices, uh, which will help them pay back debts easier. And we're going to talk about this in more detail when we talk with the populist party. Um, so this is something that is going to help industries is the McKinley tariff, but it's going to hurt farmers. And so when it's, what ends up happening is we have a compromise kind of between the two groups of uh, the industrial East and the, and the farming West. They pass something called the Sherman silver tariff, which is a trade-off with something called the purchase act. They, they wanted the, the farmers and the miners wanted the government to buy a ton of silver and then basically make that the backing for money, which is going to cause the price of silver to go up and also allow for more money in circulation. Well, the, the government didn't want to do that, but it did sort of pass this silver tariff, which is going to protect businesses on the east. So farmers really weren't helped because of this. Um, but this is something that Harrison did. And we'll talk more about silver and gold a little bit later. Okay. The country's going to be hurt by tariffs like they always are, because if we put tariffs on imports, the other country that was importing our stuff is going to put tariffs on it. So we have a trade war, which always happens with tariffs. I'm not sure why we always use them because we don't learn our history lessons. Um, in the same uh, time of Harrison's administration, the Sherman Antitrust Act is passed. And that was supposed to stop monopolies, antitrust, but because of the wording, it actually uh, hurt unions a lot. It actually uh, punished unions. So uh, during the same time, we have a lot of new states, North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, Washington, Idaho, and Wyoming. So a lot of states up in sort of the, the West. So last couple things, Ida B. Wells is going to be a, a journalist who's going to write something called The Red Record. And she is going to detail the thousands of African-Americans who are being lynched because of Jim Crow laws in the South. Uh, she even starts a movement for an anti-lynching amendment. Unfortunately, it was never ratified, but a uh, very sad time for African-Americans. But she did uh, cause people to look and, and see some of the plight that was happening to, to African-Americans. What's really going to change things for African-Americans uh, is in the 1950s when you finally have television, which is able to show you what is happening to African-Americans. But Ida B. Wells uh, is sort of considered a reformer, a.k.a. muckraker, who is sort of exposing what's really happening with African-Americans. So in, in addition to writing the Red Record, she also wrote newspaper articles uh, and, and talked about mob violence against African-Americans. Another African-American uh, civil rights leader, uh, Booker T. Washington, um, he believed that education was the, the key to improving conditions for African-Americans. And he wanted African-Americans to continue to work sort of agricultural, you know, labor jobs. And he believed, and a lot of people believed with him, that if you did this, you would prove your worth that you were on the same level as uh, your, your white brothers and sisters. And so he has sort of this idea. Uh, he is known uh, for the first uh, African-American college, which is Tuskegee over there in Alabama. A lot of high schools and other schools are named after him. Uh, he had the sort of let's work hard and earn our rights approach to uh, civil rights. Okay, He also talked about this in a very famous speech called the Atlanta Compromise, where it wasn't aggressive uh, as, as, as some would see, but more of, hey, let's work together, guys, and we can all earn equality. Tuskegee Institute was the very first school aimed to train African-Americans uh, and help them. Uh, become successful farmers and ranchers. Later on in like World War II, they're going to use it for pilot trading for African Americans. Here's a picture of Tuskegee Institute. Very pretty. Um, some of the buildings are still around today. Um, it's been around since 1881. All right, and the last one, and this is sort of like um, the, the antithesis uh, of of Booker T. Washington's ideas on civil rights, you have W.B. Du Bois or Du Bois. I don't know how you say it. Some people say it different ways. Um, but he is going to be leading African-Americans after the Civil War. 
he has a very different approach and he believes that the only way to get equality is for African Americans to demand civil rights, especially voting rights. So if you want to look at, you know, contemporaries of these two, sort of a way to look at them, Booker T. Washington is sort of like the, the Martin Luther King of his day with regard to uh, civil rights. Okay, let's, let's work slowly, let's work hard with the whites, and we'll, we'll find a way to get through these laws. More of a passive approach, I guess you'd say, uh, if, if you want to say that. Uh, and then W.E.B. -E is, is more of a radical approach, not, not radical in the sense he's going to go out and just, you know, John Brown people or anything like that. But he is going to say, look, we need to demand changes now, demand voting rights. So he's more of a Malcolm X type figure uh, in the early civil rights movement. But all three of these guys, Ida B. Wells, Booker T. Washington and W.B. Du Bois, are all very important during this time for African-Americans. All right, and there's a picture of WB. That's a sweet mustache and goatee. And uh, later on, Du Bois, with a lot of other people, including some some white people, um, are going to form the first nationwide movement for African Americans called the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Uh, and so, when we talk about settlement houses and Jane Addams helping immigrants, she's going to be part of this movement too. But this is a a big movement. That's going to, uh, it still exists today. It's been around since 1909. And we're finally going to get some traction with regard to organization for African-American rights. And that's it. Thank you.